All right, James and Laura, welcome to the Pure Desire podcast. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are excited to have you, uh, and you guys will introduce yourself here in a second. Uh, some of our listeners may be familiar with you, James, as you were in the Conquer series. Um, but today we're going to be talking about sexual abuse and this new course that you have called the Fearless series. Uh, I have seen some of it. It is excellent. Uh, it is very well done um, and is obviously a topic that we really need to address in the church. So that's why we wanted to have you guys on to talk about this series and how to really start this conversation in our churches. So uh, James and Laura, for some of our listeners, again, like I said, they'll recognize James from the Conquer series, but why don't you just introduce yourselves a little bit? Uh, tell us about life, ministry, all that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, uh, I, I married a, it was illegal for us to get married when we did. I'm, I'm so much older than her. Uh, no, actually. <laughs> that is not a great true. start, James. Great start. <laughs> yeah. We've, been married, we've been married for 42 years. Mm. Uh, we got married in 1979 uh, and um, uh, been in the ministry. Well, we started on the staff of the church uh, while I was in seminary a week after we got married as youth pastor. I had been youth pastoring before. So we, our entire relationship, <laughs> we've been in ministry together. And uh, 40, about 40 years of that as a senior pastor. And uh, we came here. This church started 37 years ago, City on the Hill here. And uh, uh, in 1992, we transitioned from a fairly typical church start to what we call the hospital church model, which ultimately has involved, evolved into all of the very helping, helping ministries that we do, mm. helping people to heal, which the Fearless series is just the most, mm. the latest one of those. And uh, I went to Baylor University, got my master, my uh, <clears throat> undergraduate degree in New Testament classical Greek. I got my master and doctorate here at Southwestern Seminary. Mm. And this is my wife, Laura. She has a much more interesting story than I do. <laughs> um, I realized that James had enough education for the both of us. <laughs> I am an artist and uh, a creative more and uh, acting, uh, painting, mm. um, mosaics, whatever, cartooning. Super cool. Um, huge uh, fan of the mouse and um, you know, actually- The Holy Land down in and I did some artwork actually for the gallery stores there that sold there in the stores. Wow. Uh, they're a difficult company to do retail with. So I thought. Very cool. <laughs> Very cool. So you, you guys have kids, yeah, grandkids. Yeah, yeah. Tell us a little about that. I have two kids. Um, I don't remember their names. Um, <laughs> but we because, have five grandkids. They had five kids between them, and I love them more than I love my own children. <laughs> they're absolutely my life. They're everything to me. And that's absolutely the truth. They spend the night at our home at least once a week. That's they have their great. own room. That's and, great. Uh, now we have two kids. Zach is our son. Oh, he, yeah. He's a. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Zach uh, is 36, and my daughter, uh, Tiffany, she's married to a pastor, and they are in Colorado Springs. He mm -hmm. just took a pastor there just before COVID, actually, mm -hmm. and wow, uh, she's a uh, pediatric yeah. trauma nurse practitioner in a children's hospital, mm -hmm. and my son is in real estate. He's a retired professional golfer. He was a touring professional for seven years, so we golf has been a big part of our life, and, uh, you know, we're just at the po point of our life now where uh, we're really... Uh, free in a lot of ways to do some things that we've never been before. Cool. Yeah. And, uh, it's pretty exciting. Yeah. And you know, Laura, you're on, you're on a podcast where we talk about pornography and sex and masturbation. And it's like, if someone is offended by Mickey Mouse, they're probably on the wrong <laughs> podcast. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> together here. Yes. yes. <laughs> they're probably not on this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. So a lot of freedom here just to share your yeah. story and be real. Um, before we jump into the the Fearless series and hear more about the the course itself and the videos and, you know, creation, all that, what what drew you guys to this topic of women's sexual abuse and sexual abuse in general? Because it is kind of like pornography and sex in the church. Like it's one of those things we just don't talk about. So what drew you to it? Let me answer that. Well, as we got into this actual where we started really opening up and allowing people to talk, tell the truth of what was really going on inside. And we started these uh, what we call support groups 30 years ago. We call them freedom groups. Now we began to hear this over and over as people would get into these safe places in these small groups, they begin to talk about those things. Mm. And we had a woman and her husband who were, had come to our church at that time. And she had ex 
she had suffered several experiences of abuse as a young girl mm -hmm. and had had some real traumatic things in her life. And she began to talk about it. She was kind of the first one that opened the door and began to get help. And so we created a group for that and she got healing and she's now on my staff and uh, has been for the last 10 years uh, in the area of helping women who are survivors of sexual abuse, but also in our post-abortion ministry uh, for helping them. So it was just one of those things that just started coming out. Once we created a safe environment, women started talking about it. And we well, okay, well, then we need to start doing that. So we've been actually ministering to survivors for about 30 years. And one of the things we've discovered is that the numbers are astronomical mm. of women sitting in the typical church on Sunday morning who have experienced sexual abuse and have never told anyone. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how we got there. And it just kind of blossomed over the years. And we have uh, groups going all the time uh, now to help women, give them a place where they can get the conversation started. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing when you open the door. I mean, on a lot of these conversations, mm -hmm. when it feels like it's not safe to talk about, that doesn't mean people aren't struggling or aren't suffering or aren't yeah. being wounded, but there's right. no place to bring it up. And so it gets dealt with quietly. People go to counselors and I'm thankful that we have counselors in our world, yeah. but if that's the only place someone feels safe, typically they're not going to feel safe in their own community, which totally. is uh, the challenge I think churches face is we've, we've got to open those doors. And so I'm so thankful that you guys are um, in, in many areas leaning in and saying the church should be just, as you said, the hospital church, it mm -hmm. should be the safe place for broken people to find healing and recovery, because if not here, where else can they go to experience yeah. the love and the message of Jesus Christ yep. in their life? Yeah. One of the tragedies of, uh, and, and I'm, I like you, I'm thankful for counselors, but one of the tragedies of that, that we've turned the help, hope and healing work of the church over to the professionals yeah. is then we never create a lifestyle community for them in the no. body of Christ yes. for that continual uh, yeah. talk and, yeah. and getting together. And, and so they're kind of, they're doing the Christian life here and they're doing their emotional healing out yeah. there and the two never get connected. And that's, yep. that's tragic. That's yes. real tragic. There, well, there's almost seems to be like an aversion from the church toward therapy, toward the clinical work that I think causes that. I mean, I think in some mm -hmm. ways you, you know, you do need to be discerning and wise as to, you know, the therapeutic models that someone might use, but if it also helps you put handles on the truth of what you see in scripture and what uh, really reconciliation, restoration, renewal mm -hmm. looks like, um, I think the two, and I mean, I don't think I know the two are married together the way that God's designed our brain. And so I think that there is though that aversion, at least the culture I grew up in the church where it's yeah. just like, you go to a counselor, like, mm, don't tell anybody, you know, it's yeah, like, really well, what do you mean? Like I'm, my life's changing. Things are getting better. Why shouldn't I share it? So I think that we run into that. And this kind of leads into the next question. You already mentioned the statistics being astronomical. They're just, they're scary. And it's not just women. It is also men right. and sexual abuse, but the numbers are definitely higher for women. Um, why doesn't the church tend to talk about this from you guys' experience in the church? I mean, I know your church has been talking about this, but as you rub shoulders Most with other pastors, <laughs> right? Like, why are churches not talking about this? Why are they avoiding this topic? Well, I think that some of it has to do with that. There's still this Victorian kind of mindset within the, the faith and, and that uh, sex is something that is secret. It's private and it's not appropriate for the, the open arena. I think that is one of them, uh, although not as true as it was 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, but it's still, I think, is a part of the, the, the thing, I think another one of the things is that many of the people that would be responsible in leading this work are struggling in areas sexually themselves yeah. mm -hmm. that they don't want to go there. And, you know, I think it was Rick Warren a couple of years ago that did that confidential survey and about what 35% of pastors had viewed pornography within the last month or something like that. And mm -hmm. so when, you know, that's not a topic that that individual who is, is struggling with that may not be yeah. really open about, you know, bringing that, that out. Yeah. And I think the third thing is that they don't know what to do with it. You know, they just simply, yeah. well, we talk about what are we going to do with this thing? Yeah. And that's the reason I created the Fearless Series is to give a tool to the church to, that would, to give them a pathway yeah. of what they can do with it when they begin to talk about it. Yeah, I'll tell you also as a woman, uh, I'm 62, so I've been around for a while. Um, 
the world is better than it was, but it is still a very male dominated world. And I found through my life just personally, and I've heard so many women say the same thing. You go to a male doctor, tell them you're struggling with whatever, and they immediately point to its female issues. Um, if you look medically at research that's done, male issues are dealt with, women's issues were behind. Mm. You know, things are changing and we're catching up, but we still, we're still women. Yeah. Mm. And no matter how capable we are, no matter how strong we are, we are still not treated the same. Mm. And when you go to a man and say, this is an issue I have, I think there's a little bit of a disconnect for most men, not all men. I'm not going to say that because I know men that will listen, but a little disconnect of, oh, well, this is okay. Well, I hope it gets better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a really good point. I don't know what to say. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just thinking about the truth that even though there's been the rise of the mega church, most people in America still attend a smaller church and Mm -hmm. the average church size in America is still under a hundred people, which in that environment I mean, not universally, but 99% of the time is going to be a male pastor, usually Mm -hmm. a male elder board or leadership team. And so you think about if if you're a woman who wants to face a sexual abuse issue in her life, the only people in leadership are men. And very Mm -hmm. often, and and not to say those men are abusive, but if, if you have had a male abuser in your life and the person to talk to are all men, it's like, that mm-hmm. that will probably yeah. feel like an unsafe environment, whether yeah. or not the person themselves, you know, the pastor could be an entirely safe person, but right. just that environment right. in most of our churches, we haven't created places where a mm-hmm. female could engage safely in that conversation yeah. with other women, with yeah. a, a female pastor or leader that, that could be a soft landing spot. And that's not right. to say you can't mm-hmm. go to your pastor. I mean, I, I think there's yeah. great pastors out there who probably have helped women yeah. walk Absolutely. into this issue, but... I think what you're bringing up, Laura, is very valid. If if a woman is feeling that from her abusive past, yeah, it probably mm-hmm. doesn't feel safe to go to that male leadership yeah. team and try to face this. Well, the, the, the truth of the matter is, she was probably abused by a male. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. she's already got some issues of trust right. with men, and she may love her pastor and think he's a wonderful guy. Yeah. But is she going to feel comfortable walking in and talking about some of the most intimate issues in her life? If you flip this thing around, guys, what you guys do with men struggling with pornography. If you had to go to a woman leader in the church to talk about your pornography, would yeah. you do that? You'd be much less yeah. willing to do that if yeah. you if that's all that was available to you was a female yeah. to get you started. You'd probably go, nah, I'm not going to talk about masturbation in front of this woman. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. I, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. And and so you would cower back. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think that's a huge issue that and we'll, we can talk about this, I guess, a little bit later on, but the church has got to provide those safe women yeah. for women to go to to start this conversation. You know, I, it's something I've been thinking a lot about. I'm I'm back in seminary finishing a master's degree, and it's something that just looking at like the catalog of classes, there are not classes on how to deal with sexual addiction, sexual abuse. And I'm not saying that every seminary across the world needs to have it, but I maybe. <laughs> yeah. Like maybe we do. Yeah. I mean, like if yeah. it's something that statistically is proven that it's such this pervert, like if we knew that 90% of people in our churches struggled with cocaine, guaranteed there'd be seminary classes on how to deal with drug addiction mm-hmm. inside the church. Um, and so I think like, and I'm not trying to shift blame at all, but I think from what I have seen generations before me of pastors tend to lean on the education and experience that they had at these institutions that did not give them the tools to handle this thing, which I think is what causes those pastors to just be like, well, I know this counselor, or I know this place over here, this organization that can help. And there's that outsourcing, which I don't think necessarily is bad because if it's handled really poorly by the pastor in that moment, it could be so much worse than go to this counselor. So I think some of it is just an ignorance maybe to what's going on. Some of it is rightly leaning on um, their experience and education, but there are gaps in that experience and education that can cause this issue too. Right. Well, I, you know, I had, I had seven years in seminary <laughs> in two degrees and had one pastoral ministry course. Mm. And basically they taught us how to baptize someone, how to, how to, right. you know, do to a funeral, officiate right. their yeah. supper yeah. and how to do weddings. Yeah. And I mean, that's what the whole thing was about. And that's the sure. mechanics. And those are important things. I mean, you, you know, cause you're going to be asked to do that the first day on the job, but there was nothing about what do you do when people are broken? Mm-hmm. And the truth of the matter is 
many of us, as we came through seminary, were broken. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're getting set up for yeah. a real train wreck mm -hmm. later on. And had they been doing those kinds of things in the, mm -hmm. the, the upper edu yeah. education process, some of us might have started getting some help earlier before yeah. the, the crash and burn. I think they, they say that one in 10 pastors will retire in the ministry. Mm -hmm. Nine out of 10 of us that start in the ministry will not retire in the ministry. And mm -hmm. that's uh, and, and a lot of times that comes because of just not having a framework of understanding of how not only do you help other people, how do you get help yeah. yourself? Yeah, totally. Yep. Well, and I, I worked in the creative ministries at our church, music, drama, that kind of thing for um, ever 30 years, I guess. And I learned pretty quickly that if I had a team of 10 people or really a group of five, one of those men, at least, if not more, uh, had an addiction to porn. Um, one of the women probably did as well. And um, several of the women, I would say, for the most part, I, I don't know a whole lot of women that haven't had some sort of abuse, whether they was, they had actual trauma, mm -hmm. penetration or whatever. Uh, not that necessarily, but yeah. I can remember 30 something times that that was approached upon me. And so if that happened to me like that, that it's, yeah, it, the statistics are very low on that. But I know this, that in seminary, when they teach music pastors how to do music, they don't ever mention, you need to be open to your people understanding that they they probably have some issues to be right. dealt with. They're pretty, pretty difficult. And I didn't have problems with men in my group saying, hey, I'm back at the porn so I'm sorry. But that and was because of the them, context yes. of our church. Sure. That yeah. Was a yeah. Place. yeah. And point, pointing mm -hmm. them back to help and then double checking to make sure they got there. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and that'd be, uh, we, we have a, at our church, we have a, uh, our motto is the hospital gown. And that's our, our mascot. Mascot. <laughs> and we talk about put your hospital gown on, untie it, and let it be open in the back. <laughs> I've heard this before. I love this. And, you know, I love this. But, the truth of the matter is we like to cover it up. We like to lap it over and tie it real tight so nobody can see what's back there. We all know what's back there. We all know something's back there. And so we just kind of say, let's just let's just be a place where we can all put our gowns on, leave the back untied, and just walk down the hallway and show everybody what we got. And without fear and without shame. Yeah. And uh, the reason a woman ministry leader that she was doing was able to do that because we were a church that was safe, mm -hmm. but she knew enough to know that she couldn't help that man. So she would get him into that place where yeah. he could get help. Yeah. We haven't done that for women. Mm -hmm. We have not done that anywhere near as much as we are for men. Now, women do not have a place in the church. That's why I created the fearless series to give a tool for women to get the conversation started and get started in the mm -hmm. process of healing. Yeah. Well, let's, let's jump into that. We're, we're talking around it, but let's, Let's talk about the Fearless series for women. Um, what is it? Who is it for? Yeah. How does it help? What will someone get out of it? Like, just dive in and, and tell us about the Fearless series for women. Well, it's strange that a man should produce and direct video series on sexual abuse of women. And people ask me that question, say, how did you get into this? And I, what happened was when my first book, Refuge, was published and when the Conquer series came out, I started getting invitations to go to churches and talk about the kind of church that we are. The, the hospital church and what's the biblical principles? How does it operate? How do you do that? So I developed a seminar going around to churches uh, over the last 10 or 11 years, helping churches to understand that. And I noticed that a lot of the churches that I was in were, were doing conquer groups, had pure desire groups, uh, if not in the church, at least in the community. But a lot of them were using the conquer series and were ministering to men in this area. And I thought, well, that's wonderful. But I never one time in those 11 years came across a single one of those churches that were ministering to women who were survivors of sexual abuse. Wow. Mm -hmm. And it dawned on me that the reason, even in those churches that were willing to do this thing about pornography for men, is they didn't have a tool, like the Conquer Series. The Conquer Series was a tool mm -hmm. to get the conversation started. It doesn't solve the issue. That's a long-term process. But it gets men together and gets them information and gives them a safe place to start talking about it. So I came back and I said to my leadership, I said, we need to do this. And uh, I asked for a big budget and they, my elders granted it. And I had a young up and coming filmmaker that was right here in my church. Very incredibly talented young man. And I tapped him. We hired him. 
And I knew some women around the country that were professionals, Shannon Etheridge, Marnie Faree, some of them, they wanted to be a part of it. So we we just went around the country uh, doing this thing. And I told Michael, I said, look, I know the subject. I know what needs to be covered. You just make it pop. You you know, you filmed it in 4K. Uh, the editing is just incredible mm-hmm. stuff. And the end result was we have the Conqueror or the Service Series for Women. It took us about three years, three years of my life. Mm. And uh, I, I, I say this to people, and I don't say it in jest. This is the most important thing I've done in 40 years of ministry. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it's just absolutely the most important thing I've done. In fact, because I believe that so much, I, uh, six weeks ago, gave my senior leadership position to my young uh, protege that I've been raising up to take my place here. Uh, and I am no longer the senior pastor. I have no leadership responsibilities. I'm the teaching pastor now. I'm responsible only for Sunday mornings. And uh, then the elders have released me to take the Fearless series out there and get it out there into churches. Uh, and I wouldn't do that if I didn't believe in it. Totally. And, but that's, that's kind of how it happened. Uh, a, a man winds up doing a series on yeah. <laughs> If we cover five topics, you ask, what is it? We cover five topics. Each video is about 25 minutes long. That's followed by a one hour small group where the women are able to get together and talk. And that's where the magic happens Mm -hmm. is in the small group. But the five topics, the first one is the prevalence of sexual abuse. And the the women that we interviewed talk about that. Then the second one is the problems that can present themselves in a woman's life who has experienced this, either as a child, an adolescent, or even an adult woman. The third is why this needs to be a priority of ministry for the church Mm -hmm. and how the church has in the past failed, but how the church now can step up to the plate, like what we've just been talking about. The fourth one is about prevention. How do we prevent this in our homes? How do we mm-hmm. talk to our children, yeah. the terminology, teach them in the community, the schools? And then the last one is what does a pathway of healing look like? And all 12 of these women are Christian women who are survivors of sexual abuse themselves, have been through the healing experience, and now are professionals in the field of helping other survivors. Mm-hmm. So they speak from a personal experience and also now from a profession. Some of them are therapists, Christian counselors. Some of them are medical doctors. One is a medical doctor. Uh, some of them have just started private ministries to help, but they're all in the helping mm. field. Yeah. And it's incredible <laughs> the stories they tell yeah. and the things that uh, they took me to school. Mm-hmm. I thought I knew a lot about the subject. As much as a man could know. Mm. And these women schooled me. We went all over the country filming this stuff. And uh, my young filmmaker, he did his magic and he put this thing together in a format that just, I, I cry every time I watch some of it. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, you and I were uh, at that conference, the SEALS conference uh, down in San Antonio, Nick, a few weeks ago. I had a man <clears throat> who's a therapist stand in front of my screen there where I was just showing the trailer, the two and a half minute trailer. And he stood there and wept. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh my gosh, there is nothing like this out there. Yeah, Yeah. very true. Yep. How much this is needed. I mean, this is a man, but he's a therapist. So he understands Mm -hmm. the woundedness. Mm -hmm. And and I looked at him and he was, tears were coming down his cheeks. I thought, Thank you, Lord, because that means I haven't wasted the last three years of my life. <laughs> totally. No. Uh, Laura, who would you say should watch this video series? Is this just for women who have been abused? Is it for everyone? Like, how would you say that? Who's the audience for this? Well, you know, the term abused is interesting because I think people have a different connotation of what that is, depending on who you are. Yeah. Uh, I was abused, but I was never uh, raped or. Uh, just, I hope I can use the word penetrated, but yeah. I, I was never actually, yeah. but I had a, an actual medical doctor um, abuse me. And uh, interesting um, the way people respond to that. Why didn't you do something? What were you wearing? Well, I was wearing a medical gown. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gosh. Yes. Um, but who should watch it? Every single woman. Because I have actually met women who, don't have a clue when you talk about siblings abusing each other. They're like, oh my gosh. Well, no, that happens actually all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they they don't have a clue. Some people don't. They need to get a clue Mm -hmm. because their friend, their aunt, their mother, 
their children may be in the process of being abused. People need to understand what this looks like. It is not just abuse. It is tra- traumatic. Yeah. And it is inviting so many things into a child's life. I'm an advocate for children. I will stand for a child um, over anything. Yeah. And we tell our kids to don't talk to strangers and all kinds of things that don't make any sense because it's not the strangers that are hurting them. And we need to empower our young girls with bravery, strength, and to be a warrior, not mm-hmm. to be pretty. Yeah, amen. And that, that's, that is part of the way we designed the, mm-hmm. con- the fearless series. I keep saying conquer series. The fearless <laughs> series for women is that it's, a, it's for all women. So a woman, when she mm-hmm. comes to these groups, she doesn't have to raise her hand and say, oh, yeah, I've been abused. Yeah. Because it's for all women and the women mm-hmm. in the church who have never personally experienced that. It's a great education process yeah, for yeah. them to understand the women who have. Yeah. But it also gives a safe entry point for the women who have to just come and be a part of this mm-hmm. thing. And then in the small group experience is where that magic starts happening. They start telling their story. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And once that happens, then we have the, the, the easy track to move them further into a longer healing experience. Right. And uh, so the the fearless series for women is just this big, safe, open door for mm-hmm. all women in the church. Yeah. I will tell you though, too, Trevor. I I would love for men to watch it. Yes. Because for so long, I it wasn't that long ago that I sat walked onto my campus at uh, in my college campus and was rated by every boy I walked by from on a scale of one to ten. That wasn't that long ago. And there is kind of the good old boy. Oh, well, guys, you know, they whistle, they, yeah. you know, whatever. Boys uh, will women, be boys. Boys yeah. will be boys. Totally. I mean, I've heard that from a lot of good men that actually protect women and think that women should have way more credit than they're given. Yeah. And I still was hearing that from men. So I would love for men to watch it. Will they? Probably not like a sitcom, like a rom- rom-com. They, uh-huh. they won't watch for the most part. Come on, guys. Well, um, step up to the plate and watch this yeah. and get informed about what could be happening right. to your children yeah. or what might have happened to your wife or girlfriend or sister or mother mm-hmm. and come alongside. Yeah. yeah. I think we just, um, some of our staff just went through module one of the PSAP training um, from ITAP. And one of the things they talked about was sexual abuse. And um, for me, I don't, I don't have that as a part of my story or a part of my background, but I do look at it differently now, getting more of that information and that education on it. And it's something that now I know the signs to look for. Now I understand, um, you know, like, gosh, I think about so many things, even just modern names that um, are big in ministry, that this is a part of their story and it's now coming out, right? And you can name the names, you know, there's plenty of them. But I think that if we want to have this stop happening, we have to be proactive. We can't just wait for it to happen and then try to react in a, a positive way, a helpful way. We also have to, like you're saying, and this is why I think the value of, of any man or any leader, whether abuse is in your story or not, to watch this is because how do you better influence the culture around you when it comes to this topic? How do you better identify it when you see it? How do you better right. help people take that next step into healing? And so, I, I mean, if if you don't hear anything Anybody and everybody should watch the Fearless series because well, it's, a, it's so prevalent. And I will challenge all of you male pastors to care enough to watch it. Don't pass it to your female, mm. you know, take care of the women thing person. Watch it yourself so you are informed of what we are going through, what yeah. we have gone through. Yeah. You know, it's, I've had an interesting experience. We've just kind of debuted the series, uh, well, when I was in San Antonio with you a few weeks ago at the sales conference, uh, was, was when our website went live nationally. And uh, so, but before that, I had a lot of interest from pastors and people that are women in their church that would ask their pastor if I could send some information to them. Not a single one of those pastors followed up on that. And what did I tell you? It died. You're on the talking pastor. to the wrong person. They're not going to listen. Right, and she did, and it died yeah. on the pastor's desk for several reasons. One, he's a man, yeah. so he doesn't get it. Yeah. I'm going to give him credit for that. But the second reason is he looks at that and he thinks, "I don't have a clue what to do with that." Yeah, and so they don't understand that this has got to be led by women. It's not something the pastor has to lead. 
it, the women are going to lead it. So mm -hmm. I've, I, I wish, I wish, and like it's happened in my church, but it took 30 years to get here. It's where the men would kind of lead this thing to say, we have got to deal with this issue. One out of three women sitting in the church on Sunday morning, on average, they tell us one out of three have At experienced least. some kind of overt abuse. Marty Faree talks about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And, and, the, and the, the female population is the largest population of the church. If one third of them have experienced and the vast majority have never told anyone, this is a ministry that the church is just dropping the ball on. Mm -hmm. Yeah because of the things that happen in a woman's life as a result of this experience. So we've talked about it already a little bit that uh, what the course, what the, the videos are, that time where they have the magic happens, as you said, they have that conversation. Mm -hmm. And you talk about coming out of that, what those next steps are for healing. As you have people going through this, what are those next steps? What are things that we're encouraging people once they've watched this series? What are the things that they can start to do around them? Well, once again, I designed this for a church context, uh, and we've learned over the years that our group experience needs to run about 13 weeks because that's how people still think in semesters. Uh, so from the fall, you got to get finished before Christmas because around Christmas time, people quit coming to the group. And then early spring, you got to get finished before the kids get out of school because everybody goes on vacation. So we've styled all of our freedom groups that deal with all these different issues to be 13 week time frame. So I did that same thing with the fearless series. Uh, it's five weeks of the videos for all women. There's a study guide that goes with it. And then they have that small group experience. And in that small group is where the magic starts happening. Then out of that, the women who have actually talked in those small groups about the fact that they have had experience of sexual abuse then there's a, a workbook that mm. follows that up Great. where we deal that I also wrote that deals with the issues of shame, which is incredibly attached to any form of trauma or abuse, deals with all the forgiveness issues, the guilt issues, the lies that we begin to live our lives by because of the traumatic event. And so it gets them in, in, into a, an intensive small group experience with only other survivors. Mm. So it, after yeah. the series, it's only survivors that yeah, go into a safe that place. Right. Right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. With a trained facilitator mm -hmm. who is herself typically a survivor. Yeah. In the beginning, you may not be able to do that if you don't have someone to leave, sure. but that's how we do ours. So it's a 13 week deal. Now that doesn't, someone doesn't get full healing in 13 weeks, mm -hmm. but they get started. Yeah. Yeah. It yep. gets the movement started. Yeah. And we're finding we're on about our fourth or fifth time with it now in our church that women will go through it again mm -hmm. and again, because each time you peel another layer of the onion yep. back yep. and you're with other people. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, you know, so the, it just, it's a tool to get the thing started. Just like the Conquer Sears did. Then they go into your pure desire groups, which is the longer term healing experience. Mm -hmm. yep. And, and that, that's necessary. But if women don't have some kind of place to start the conversation, it'll never happen. Mm. And so I designed it that way. Yeah. So it could fit within those parameters of people's lives yeah. right? where they live. Yeah. One, you know, one of the great things about what we've seen with the Conquer series, and I'm sure you have as well, is it, it does not only create that, that space for like men to get honest about their struggles and pornography use and that sort of thing within the church context, it tends to catalyze change in the conversations and, and, you know, um, in a challenging way, maybe marriage is blowing up because a guy's being honest at home and, right. and, truth needed to be faced, but that yeah. leads to, okay, now we're looking for help. And, yeah. and I think in a similar way, the fearless series will create that kind of um, catalyst in a church of while wow, women are finding help and now they're talking and maybe they're starting to bring up things that happen to them. They're starting to share. Yeah. If, if that happens in a community, James, or in a church, and for you also, Laura, what are ways, um, if we're a man or a woman listening, who maybe we didn't go through fearless for ourselves, but we're in a church community where women are now opening up, starting to say things, share stories. Um, what are wrong ways that we can respond to them bringing up sexual abuse? Like, what have you seen that is, is hurtful and harmful? And then after that, we'll, we'll ask some follow-up questions about what are the right ways to respond. But, yeah. but yeah. let's start there. Like, what should we not do in that situation? <laughs> okay. Uh, that's actually fairly simple if you think about it. I think, so one, think about what you're saying before you say it. Yeah. 
Um, I know people want, people are good. They're not basically bad. They want to be encouraging. They want to be comforting, but they aren't sometimes because they don't think. And I know from my personal experience that I mentioned, like the doctor, when I would tell people, one of the things that was said to be my, by men, not my husband, of course, but was, why didn't you do something? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, okay. Oftentimes women are so shocked. They don't yeah. Know, yeah. It's they like, don't do. I don't know. Should I have done something? Like I, I, I did once I figured out that I was being hurt. Yeah. Um, but I have also talked to, I, I don't know at this point, probably hundreds of women that have been uh, sexually traumatized. And that was, I heard that over and over. Mm. I asked, what were you wearing? Um, why were you out? Um, why did you go there? Yeah. Uh, what? Yeah. Well, it, so immediately the blame starts yeah, getting pointed yes. back yes. toward the woman. Why it's a would cynical. You it's cynical. It's this. It's a yeah. cynical lens that they take it in, right? Yeah. yeah. Why didn't you tell your mother? Oh uh, well, she knew and didn't yeah. do anything. So. Yeah. Or it was my yeah. step. Or it was my stepdad that was abusing me. You know, how do you tell your mother? I mean, yeah, but, and they don't believe me. One of yeah. the one of the women on the so fearless believe series, them. <laughs> yeah, believe and they them. tell you. One of the women on the fearless series that that I asked that question specifically to, she she ministers to women. She not one of the women in my that I interviewed got their help in the church. Mm-hmm. They got it outside, and now they're bringing it back in. Yeah, but she said. All of the women that she ministers to are women who are minister are, are in churches, mm-hmm. and, and I say, well, why won't they get help in the church? She says, it's because I'm going to be shamed, mm-hmm. I'm going to be blamed, mm-hmm. and I'm not going to be believed. Mm-hmm. All of these women, the reason they seek outside help, because if I go to the church, if I go to my pastor, if I go to some, I'm going to be shamed, I'm going to be blamed, and I'm not going to be believed. And also they look and they go, well, there's not really any help in the church. Yeah. yeah if they've so been they honest outside. and they've been heard and even maybe the words that came back, which are always the right words. I am so sorry that happened to you. Not asking questions about it. Just be sorry that happened to that human mm-hmm. being. Yeah. Okay. So now what do we do? Yeah. So the, the power of the listening yeah. ear. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I mean, yeah. I have this uh, perspective on on that that we have such a hard time seeing people in suffering, so we just quickly go to solving the problem, and so it's this yeah. mm-hmm. selfish, you know, perspective that we carry into it. And I'm as guilty as anybody else, probably the worst of it. But I think that mm-hmm. that's usually what happens: is I don't know what to do with this. I have not been in this situation before, and so I'm just going to try to fix it. Like, and then, and obviously, you don't have the abuser in the room. Who do you have in the room? The one who was abused. So it's like, okay, well, let's focus on you, right? And yeah. I, I mean, we were talking about this. There's nothing to send them to. Right, yeah. right. I mean, they don't have money maybe for a counselor. Yeah. You know, at least yeah. that would be something. Yeah. But so they tell you and you go, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Well, but I'll pray it. for you. Yeah, yeah. that's right. the end of it. Yeah. yeah. Good luck. yeah. Pray what do you do for yeah, that right. boy? Right, right. Gosh. That's why the church has yeah. to The has church to has think, to have it. They have to think strategically yeah. about this. Mm-hmm. And, and we think strategically about a lot of things, about Bible study, about spiritual gifts, about mission. Mm-hmm. We think very strategically about those things, mm-hmm. but we don't think strategically about this emotional healing element in people's mm-hmm. lives who have been hurt and have been wounded. And of course, this is about the, the, the women. Mm-hmm. And, and we just haven't thought strategically about that. And mm-hmm. again, the fear of series is to help a church start thinking strategically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To actually think through this is a problem. This is a tool and this is a track right. that we can get on yeah. to begin to, to help people who have been, who have experienced this. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and it does, it, it absolutely does. We've, we just had stories mm-hmm. after stories after stories of women who just say, you know, thank you so much for this. This has been life changing. Yeah. And that's encouraging yeah. to hear that. Yeah. Well, I like so much what you're saying that this is a group that can be run by women for women. The pastor doesn't need to lead. And I think some fast pastors feel that burden of like, well, man, I'm, I've got to become the expert on everything. If I'm going to help anyone, it's like, yeah. no, you just need to open the door. You just yeah. need to yes. allow this to matter yeah. and yeah. to create community 
just like you said, so that when someone does come forward, not only is there grace, but there's competency. Mm -hmm. There's the grace to be a safe place, but then the competency to follow up. And what we're trying to do and what I hear you trying to do here is equip the pastor to say, I'm so sorry that happened. We believe you. That's that's a very, very difficult situation. And we're so glad that we have this fearless series. We'd love for you to go through it with some Mm -hmm. other women that are are walking through some of the same things. And and now you've got grace and competency, which leads to life transformation. Because typically they're not gonna go to the pastor to to expecting him to help them heal. They are going to someone that they view as an individual of respect Mm -hmm. and who is going to care to just tell the story. They, 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 you know, we need to tell our story. There's tremendous power in that. Mm -hmm. And so when he is empowered with a tool and with women in the church that will take this ministry on to say, I'm so sorry this happened to you. Let me put you in a place where with other women, you can enter into this experience of healing. What that's going to mean to a woman is going to be astronomical because she doesn't expect the pastor to help her heal. Mm -hmm. She knows he doesn't know anything about it. She just wants him to hear her. He wants him. She wants to know that he cares. Yeah. Well, she probably did not go to him to tell him that story. She went to him to say, I, my marriage, my third marriage is falling apart or I am angry all the time and Mm. I cannot figure this out. And he is not equipped enough to know. Again, I'm not a male basher. I don't do that, but. Except me. (laughs) (laughs) On occasion. Um, But what he needs to get educated on is that this is so prevalent. And most of what she's saying it, you could take a direct path to the abuse in the past. Yeah. She may, she probably has no idea because yeah. she's never told anyone. And she certainly has never dealt with it because where do you do that? Yeah. Where do you go help, get help for that? Yeah. And so she's trying to fix all these things that are broken. They have a root issue. Yeah. yeah. And they're not going yeah. to the root. It's just no. watering right. on top and it's not doing, it's not doing anything. And for her to be able to go, to, and to say, these are, I'm, I'm broken. I yeah. don't get it. Yeah. For him to be able to say, look at her and say, well, let me ask you, have you had abuse in your past? I don't need, I don't need details. Yeah. I want to send you to a, to some, a, a group that we have. And this is one thing I love about the five week. And then the eight week is five weeks is only five weeks. So you can open the door for these women, many who have never told anyone before, and follow it with another group starting up. If you're able to do that, have a facilitator and are committed to it, start another one pretty quickly so that once you identify people that are hurting, they don't have to wait and wait Mm -hmm. and wait to get some help because they may go away. Right. Yeah, Yeah. so good. Uh So, you know, on the positive side, let's flip that around because you said we we would talk about what can be done. Sure. Mm-hmm. And, and that's very simple. Yeah, usually our guests wait for us to ask the questions, like, but go, go for, for it. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you can't call and go. You said, yeah. we're going to talk about where it's failed, but yeah, then yeah, we're going to yeah, talk yeah, about yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you, actually you did. You gave me the, the heads the up on light. Yeah. They have to hear, and several of the women on the Federal Series said this, one of the things that pastors got to do is got to start talking about this. Yes. From the pulpit. Mm-hmm. The church needs to hear him say, this is a problem, and not only in our culture, but it's a problem within the body of Christ right here. There are women in our midst that have experienced this trauma, never told anyone, have never gotten help, and start just the conversation publicly like that. Mm -hmm. Second, then, have a woman that is the appointed point person for these women to go to. Not him, not any male staff member. But have a woman who is caring, is compassionate. It would be best if she has experienced this yeah, and had some healing. Yeah. But you may not, he may not even know that. But you know, there's just a woman that knows how to hold someone else's hand and listen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That women will see is safe. Point that person. Let that person's name be known. This is your person, ladies. Yeah. You can talk to her. Yeah. And then say, and then have a strategy. Yeah. Get a track, get a get a something to do after this happens. Because the worst thing that could happen is talk about it, have a point person, and then mm-hmm. have nowhere for them to go after right. that, other than say now you need to go to counseling. Yeah. Like Laura said, some may not even be able to afford that. Yeah. 
And so those three things, talk about it, Pastor. Appoint a woman and give her visibility. Let mm-hmm. them know who she is. Yeah. And then get a strategy yeah. and watch what God will do. So this is, and it, this, this question goes along with it. Because not all of our listeners are pastors or leaders in churches. There are men and women who maybe have abuse in their past, maybe do not. Um, but they also want to help create this safe place. And so, Laura, mm-hmm. I'd ask you, just as a Christian woman who has experienced abuse, what are things that we can do just as lay people, churchgoers, maybe we volunteer, maybe we are leaders, what can we do to create the church as a safe place to talk about this? Okay, well, let me say, first of all, we... This was developed and we have seen it work where groups are the are the key. Mm -hmm. Having people together, even if it's one or two other people, shared experience is is amazing what God does with that in the healing experience. I also realized, and I've talked to James about that, that I realized from the women I've met, I have met women before that are like, they are not going anywhere near a church. Mm. They're not going anywhere near a group. They're not going to tell anybody. So if they hear that there's something like this they can get their hands on, maybe it'll help. To do it individually. Do it individually. And that is not how we're not encouraging that. But I realize I realize from people I know personally that if they knew that was available, they would be right on it. Because, like, they've spent thousands of dollars on counseling that has gone maybe nowhere. Not that all counseling is good or bad, but they, they need to have a safe place, even if it's in their home dealing with this and with all the things that have happened in our world over the past year, there needs to be that. But also I can see very easily, I'm very practical. So I can see very easily just the women I know on my street. I would be so willing to go door to door and I will go door to door and say, Hey, I'm having this thing at my house. We're going to do it Thursday nights. As long as it's convenient for everybody. Um, There'll be, you know, four or five of us. It's about um, sexual trauma and abuse um, on women. Um, I'd love for you to come and listen. And if it's not for you, you don't have to come again, but I, I would love for you to come be a part. Yeah. And you don't have to have been a beat. Like, I'm not asking them for their story. They can tell me. I had a woman tell me today, unsolicited. But they can tell me or not. I'll give them the freedom not to say anything. Yeah. But you can invite them over to your house yeah. and do a group. Yeah. I These think- are, you know, um, the shared experience part that she talked about, that's the genius. For 30 mm-hmm. years, we've been doing that. Yes. With these groups, we don't do it individually. We do very little one-on-one. There are some mentoring experiences that we do one-on-one, but but for the most part, we want people in a community experience with eight eight or ten other individuals, mm-hmm. because the Holy Spirit just does things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he reveals things to you about yourself that you didn't even know just by hearing that other person yep. tell their story. Totally. Vice versa. And then that mutual, oh, I thought I was the only one that goes away because I'm not the only one. And goodness, pastors don't understand. I've talked about this around the country about developing this kind of hospital model. And it sounds to a pastor like that's going to be a whole lot of work for him. And I say, no, pastor, it's going to take work off of you because this is body ministry. Mm -hmm. The people have to do this work or you don't have enough staff to do these groups and to lead these groups. And so Fearless Series is is one, just one expression of that. But we have 30 different types of groups in our church, 30 different types of groups. They're running year round. We have groups every night of the week, seven days a week here to fit people's schedules. And people come to that because there's that shared experience. It's just powerful. Yeah, Yeah, we've seen that so much with groups that it breaks people out of. The power of shame and isolation, because when Absolutely. I can share my whole story and find acceptance and empathy and love and other people are doing the same, like that's what changes us. And, you know, and so what I hear you saying is that if someone could get this series and watch it by themselves, that would be good. If they could yeah. get the series and watch it with a group of others, that would be better. Or if they could get it and their church is taking women through it as a community, that's best. Yes. But any option, like wherever you're at, start with the option that's available to you. Yeah. 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 The genius of what you guys have done with your pure desire groups is that 
they're not all located in churches, but you know where all of them are located. So when something comes up in a local church, you guys are able to point them mm-hmm. to a particular group in their community. I, I don't think I told you this story, Nick, but when I was down at the SILS conference, a man came up to me to my table where I was showing the Fearless series. And he, he looked at me and I said, hello, how are you? And he says, you don't remember me, do you? Did I, I don't remember if I told you the story or not. Uh-huh. But I said, well, no, I, I don't think I do. And he started kind of talking and I said, you're a physician, aren't you? He said, yes, I am. I said, I remember you four years ago. He and his wife, he's a doctor in a community about two and a half mile hours from our church. He got caught pornography and they started looking for a place where they could get help. And they couldn't. He found our church. They drove all the way to City on the Hill on Sunday morning, came up to me after church and introduced themselves, told me their story very quickly. Mm. I turned them over to my uh, guy on my staff that is head of all of our groups. And we found them a pure desire group Mm. that was about 30 minutes from his town. Mm -hmm. Because we, we, I think we called, I think Brian called y'all and said, have you got anything within driving distance? Mm. He got into that group. It was not in a church. He went through the entire seven pillars a year. He now is leading groups Mm. in his community. His wife is a life coach. Mm -hmm. And the reason they came to the SEALs conference is because of her for her benefit. And he just came with her. Mm. And I went, oh, my soul, how thankful I am that you came up and reminded me of yeah, this. That's, awesome. cool. that's so and cool. That, that is. It's, a, it's an affirmation of what you do, but it's an affirmation of the power of this group experience. Yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. 100%. Providing that. Yeah. And, and the church, you know, more of your groups need to be able to, the door, church needs to open their door to y'all's groups. They just need mm-hmm. to open the door to these community yeah. experiences because that's where healing happens. Yeah. yeah. But that was, that was a phenomenal story. I, I meant to tell you that. And I forgot to. <laughs> that, uh, wow. I thought, cool. wow, this is so cool. Yeah. And his marriage has been saved. Totally. Yeah. That's awesome. What, and he was know, on the end. I, I want to kind of throw a different last question in here. Maybe Trevor has another follow up question, but I, I'm just thinking about our listeners and, and the number of people that this is honestly not a topic we've even done a full episode on very much on our podcast, and we're over 200 episodes. And so they're maybe hearing some things that are tapping into, you know, trauma and pain from way back there. And there's a part of them just going, I don't want to revisit it. I really don't want to bring it up. I'd rather, uh, they don't know if they want to take next steps. Like, they're maybe just thinking through, should I do this? Do I want to? Maybe they don't feel safe going to a pastor or a church. What what kind of encouragement or or direction would you give to that person that's having some stuff stirred up and is just trying to think, what what do I do with this? What would you say to that person? And that could be male or female. I, I, w- I would use the words of one of the women on the Fearless mm-hmm. series. She said, views sexual abuse as cancer of the soul. It has to be dealt with. Mm. If it's not dealt with, it will destroy you. Mm-hmm. And, and I like to say to people, if you have not dealt with your past, as painful as that is, and we all know who've yep. been through that, it's very painful. Yep. It, it costs you something, as Marnie Furry says. Mm-hmm. But if it, you have not dealt with your past, it is not your past. Mm-hmm. It is your present mm-hmm. and it is your future. Mm-hmm. Wow. So for the person who has been wounded to say, I don't want to, do that. I just want to put that in the past. It's not going to stay there. Right. Doesn't stay it's there. the yeah. night of the living dead. Uh-huh. It keeps coming back to life. Yep. And so the encouragement yep. is as much as you fear it, as much as you dread it, it has to be done mm-hmm. because it's mm-hmm. a cancer of the soul. And what I would say to you, if this is you that he, that, that Nick is talking about, it's pulling a Band-Aid off or a scab off that just continues to bleed that never will heal. It, it gets harder before it gets better. Yeah. You need to know that. It always does. But until you are willing and listen, you are a woman. You are capable. You are strong. You are brave. You can put a freaking child into this world. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So. Yes. Listen to me, no matter what you've been told, you can do it. You are able mm. to walk through this, walk through it to get on the other side. Mm. Amen. Stop drowning in the middle of it because yeah. it will always drown you eventually. Things will get better for a minute. They will. They'll get better for a minute. Mm-hmm. And then you'll find yourself there again. Yeah. End it. 
by starting the process. And it is a process, but it does get better. God heals the God heals the wounds of the broken heart. And he cares about you, mm-hmm. not just other people. He cares about you. People are going to stop asking me to come and they're going to start asking her. Yeah, to come. So absolutely. So yeah. Good. yeah. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, sexual abuse is happening. It's happening in the church. It's happening in our families. And we don't have the luxury to avoid it anymore. And, I, you know, as, no. as you guys have been sharing, one thing that comes to mind, you know, James, you talked about it from the pulpit, that uh, if we don't talk about it in the church, there is this shame that's carried that I'm the only one. And that's one of the, that is one of the biggest, I think, most powerful weapons of the enemy is, and I think, I can't remember, it might even have been you, James, on the Congress series, I can't remember, but inflicting everybody with the same disease and then convincing them that they all are the only one. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And we have a responsibility to help drop the shame for people, to help bring mm-hmm. the message that this is something that happens and that there, that there is hope. And what's beautiful is that the Fearless series is a great first step to experiencing that hope. And that's exactly what it's for. It's an entry way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so you can get the series and correct me if I'm wrong. It's fs4women.com. F- yeah, S- S- the number the four, number four okay. women.com and you can get your copy, get the study guide and the workbook and start a healing movement in your community because this is a movement that your community needs. Uh, James, oh, Laura, you guys are amazing. Thank you so much for the series. Thank you for your time today. And honestly, I can like smell the passion from where I sit right in Oregon with mm-hmm. you guys in Texas when it comes to this. So thank you so much. Well, it, it may be oil that you're smelling, you know, <laughs> Texas is the great oil state. And look, I, I have to mention what I'm looking at. I'm looking at two young men, men that care yeah, that means about the women around them. Thank you for doing that. Mm-hmm. That's That will change things. Sure will. Sure Thank will. you for calling me young. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that. You're younger than me. Yes. 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 People that used to look old look young now. So yeah, that's right. I used to have two eyes, so I mean, lot's changed. <laughs> Gosh. Well, again, thank you guys. Good stuff, you and guys. Thank you. Wherever you're at on your journey, Pure Desire is here to help create a roadmap for your healing. If you or someone you know is impacted by sexual brokenness, go to puredesire.org and let's start the healing journey today. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. Each week, we put out new content to help you on the road to freedom from the effects of sexual brokenness and betrayal trauma. And lastly, never stop being healthy. <laughs>